right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM coming to you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by David Jennings, who is in another favorite city of mine in Melbourne, Australia. Hey, John, how are you? Fantastic to join you on the other side of the pond. Or maybe, maybe previously one of my favorite cities, because I think if you went there right now, um, you'd be locked up in, wouldn't you, in a hotel for at least 14 months or days or a month or something. You guys are in a pretty strict lockdown. It's, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm glad I've been working virtual for a while now. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's not too dissimilar for me because I'm, I'm used to working online. Okay, and David uh, runs, he's the founder and CEO of uh, Systemology and the author of the book, Systemology, create time, reduce errors and scale your profits with proven business systems. And actually, I'd just like to start off, um, David, there's, there's a very solid reason why you got interested in, in systems and efficiency in the first place, right? If you want to just yes. explain that. Yeah, the biggest thing that was my turning point, because I've been involved in a lot of different businesses, but my mm. last business, the digital agency, I got stuck in it for about 10 years, just working in the operations of it. And for some reason, I didn't think I could systemize that business. I thought that business was different. And then I found out we were pregnant and I thought, oh, I don't want to be working 70 hour weeks and working on the weekends and the mornings and just not having enough time to really be present as the kids grew up. So that's when I thought, right, well, I know systems and processes are the way. I know mm -hmm. it is the only way to build a business that works without me. And I know other people have done it. So why can't I do it? And, and I realized there were just a, a bunch of roadblocks and baggage that I was holding on to that just wasn't true about business systems. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you say that because, I mean, if we relate that to, uh, to business today, maybe to sales in particular, because, you know, sales is always one of those last frontiers of where you know, process, you know, people are, are you know, maybe, um, are instinctively hostile to process because they think, well, sales is a very creative thing. And if you put process down, you're restricting my ability to operate. But I always think that that's exactly the wrong way to look at process. Mm. Well, one of the biggest misconceptions is that um, process removes creativity. Mm -hmm. It actually does the opposite because what happens is there are certain functions in sales and throughout all of the different departments in business, certain things need to happen. So you might have a sequence for the way that uh, the lead comes in and you respond and you qualify and you might have a sales call. Then some of that data needs to be getting logged into the CRM and then there needs to be some level of follow-up. Uh, and when you've made the sale, there's some sort of uh, way that you'd hand over to accounts or potentially to the back office team to then start on delivery. So already just by me talking through that, you can almost hear this linear journey mm -hmm. and certain things happen at certain points. So systemizing is about creating process around the things that have to happen so that you don't have to think of it as a salesperson mm -hmm. so that you're freed up to go, well, now I can sell and I can just focus on where the creative bit is because all of the other admin stuff is now more automatic. So that's, yeah. that's definitely one of the biggest ones. Um, the other one I find particularly with sales and I mean, it extends to all, uh, parts of business, people think even if I had systems and processes, my team wouldn't follow them anyway. So what's the point of creating them? And I, I find it's, it's part of once you start the journey and you start to change the culture in your team and you develop a way of getting to the point where you just say, this is the way that we do things here. Most of the resistance comes from those first team members that have been with you the longest because they're just used to doing things a certain way. But as you grow and you get new salespeople on um, and they get introduced to the business and the way of doing things, and that's all they've ever known, it, it's actually much easier to get your team to follow process than you think. Yeah, absolutely. So when you start off on a, on a, on a journey of systematizing something, I mean, your book lays it out very very nicely from stage one to stage seven but the define i always find the define part at the very beginning is often one of the toughest parts uh, but it's also because sometimes people are hardwired to start look at a process and then they start thinking of all the variables and all the things that possibly could happen so they decide to start to try and define and build their process 
uh, to all the exceptions as opposed to as opposed to building it to the rule mm. and dealing with exceptions later yeah i you know in a former life i used to um be involved in the stock market education space mm. and we used to design trading systems and that was all about you would think about these predefined rules up front so when you're in the market with your money you don't get emotional because you've got a set of rules to follow mm. and the the big insight that came from when i did that was a great system is something that works in all market conditions so the mm. the system needs to be broad enough that it captures you know the most of the scenario um, and then it can be applied in varying situations as opposed to something that's so hyper-focused and detailed down to the point where it only works in one situation and doesn't leave any sort of room for outside of that. Now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of having, you know, especially this is your first start in systems, having good systems and great people um, rather than having great systems and good people. Like, because a, a great person with a system that gives them guide right rails and, you know, mm. rough framework to follow will get a significantly better outcome. So it's, yeah, it, it is about uh, looking at what you're currently doing, capturing best practice of what you're doing, not going super detailed to start mm. with and just trying to bring everybody up to that standard. That's kind of like level one. Yeah. And I think that's, and I think that's a, it's a good way to put it because as I said, I think people, people want to go to solution mode immediately and they want to build out these things and they, they become, you know, uncontrollable, very fast. And then um, what stage two of your, your system is a sign. What do you mean by a sign? Yeah. So this is the idea that the business owner oftentimes is the worst person to be creating the systems and the processes. Uh, mm. They are busy. They see systems as important, but not urgent. So they never get to them. For some reason, the business owner, oftentimes if they're the startup founder, the person who got the business off the ground, they feel like, because oftentimes they do, they know how to do everything within the business. They know all the different facets. So they jump to the conclusion thinking, okay, well, I need to create all the systems because I know how to do everything. But then what happens is it never gets done. So stage two, a sign is all about once you've identified the handful of mission critical systems, how do we then identify where in the team the knowledge resides? Even mm -hmm. if it's not absolutely perfect, what is you know, the best salesperson do? Let's just capture what they're doing and get everybody up to that stage. And that's a big part of this idea that um, in the early days, you're not looking to create systems from scratch or re-engineer what you're doing just capture what you're doing. Don't try and go, ah, oh, we should, you know, now that I'm looking at systems, yeah. we should create a new CRM platform or we should change the way that this sales process is working. Cause then that, that takes you out of the flow of just getting it done, which is more important mm. at the start. And it's interesting you say that like taking, you know, say in this case in sales, like taking the top performers and looking at what they're doing, um, sometimes you have to actually look at what they're doing because there's an interesting phenomenon uh, that Neil Rackham, when he did his research years ago for spin selling uncovered is that a lot of the best salespeople are what we would call unconsciously competent. They have no idea what they do to be successful. They just do it. So sometimes you have to actually uh, observe them and say, okay, let's look at these couple of guys who are top performers. What is it that they do differently than everybody else? Because if you went and asked them, they'd say, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I remember going to a, a workshop by a guy called Richard Bandler many moons mm -hmm. ago. And um, he does a lot of work, you know, brain type work. And he was employed by the US military to improve a lot of their marksmen and their accuracy. Mm -hmm. So he found one of the, you know, most accurate marksmen and then said, okay, we'll fire a gun. And he just fired a gun and watched him and, and, he said, now explain what's happening. And he had to probe and really ask questions to dive into what was going on in his brain. And he said, well, what I actually do is he goes, I visualize as though there is a invisible laser sitting on the top of my gun. And I mm -hmm. just line up the dot on top of that gun with, you know, the invisible laser. And then I shoot. And just that process alone made it infinitely more accurate. The 
top marksman didn't really recognize what he was doing because he was mm -hmm. unconsciously competent, found out how he was, once Richard dug a little bit deeper, he took that process, then taught that to the rest of the, mm -hmm. uh, the soldiers, and then they were infinitely mm -hmm. more accurate. And it was just by what was going on in their head. So you're exactly yeah. right. There's, I mean, that's one example, but it, it exists in business. And it's, if you can capture that, you, it can be a game changer. Yeah, and that's why sometimes it's not the best idea is just to go and say, hey, write down what it is you do and then we'll implement it because you know, what you get back is probably not what they actually do or what they think yeah. they should be doing. And that's the third stage of systemology, which is extract. Mm -hmm. And this idea, one of the uh, key insights I had is that it's a two-person job. You've got the person with the knowledge and then you have a second person who is the documenter. So all mm -hmm. you do is you record the person doing the thing and then the second person, you know, if they're there while it's being recorded, they'll ask the questions for clarity and dig into it. But then you get someone else who literally watches the video, the recording, whether it's a Zoom yeah. or, you know, so I've done it with clients in a sales situation where they've, you know, just recorded the audio on their phone. Mm -hmm. um, if for privacy reasons they couldn't do that or didn't feel comfortable doing that, then we would role play it out. Like we do whatever we can just to get, the knowledgeable person yeah. to do their thing. Yeah. And then your next stage is, is organized. So when you say organize, what are you, what are you organizing? Are you organizing all the elements into the right place? Yeah. It, a big part of it is thinking about what your so software stack will look like mm -hmm. and where things are going to live. So you'll have a system and a process and some videos and things like that. Where's all of that going to be in one mm -hmm. location. So the entire team know where to get it. And um, what, uh, what project management platform, if anything, are you going to use to be able to assign out tasks? It's just mm -hmm. making sure that you've got some way to measure what's going on. And, and really yeah. it's about accountability. Mm -hmm. And then the integrate part is obviously very critical because number one, I mean, the integration takes on a lot of different, uh, different guises. I mean, number one, it, it needs to be integrated into their daily work practice. Otherwise it's not going to work. And if you have a system, you know, say like a CRM like ours, it needs to be, you know, you probably want it to integrate with some of the other systems you have. So all the process flows, the systems are all working together efficiently. Yeah. And um, in the book, I, I talk a lot about uh, integration specifically also around the staff, like, yeah. cause, cause you, you want the buy-in for them. You want to integrate this systems culture with the way that they do things and you want to have them, buy into the process early, be involved in the development of the systems and the processes because people oftentimes support what it is that they help to create. And you want to learn how to handle some of the resistance because all of the resistance from building a systemized business comes up front. Uh, and then that's oftentimes why people abandon it. But all mm. of the, the benefit of the systemization actually happens once you get over that hump but most people never get over the hump. Um, so it's, yeah, a big, a big part of understanding what those resistance is, seeing how that you present it, seeing how you get the buy-in uh, and making it part of the way that you do things. The, the good thing is with right now, the way the pandemic is happening, yeah. everybody's very open to change. So now is the perfect time to be looking at systemizing your business. Yeah, and and we've certainly seen that is that uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of lip service being played to, to paid to rather to digital processes, and people were going, yeah, yeah, we need to have our digital digital processes in place. But you know, when when times are good, it's very easy to ignore and paper over the cracks, and you know we're very tolerant of inefficiencies when everything is great. Uh, but then when the pandemic hit, then people realized, okay, now I really need to get my digital processes in place. Uh, and the ones who were able to do some of that quickly are doing okay. The ones who weren't are, are struggling, you know, mightily right now. And the next stage you say here is is scale. So yes, you have to, you, your your the process and systems that you build have to be able to scale with your business. Yeah, and I think of it one of the very first stages um, define. We talk about identifying the mission critical systems what are the mm -hmm. 10 to 15 systems that you, you get started on first because you know it's that that uh, metaphor people use how do you eat an elephant one bite at yeah. a time so yeah. you've yeah. got to first start somewhere once you move into the scale stage though you have to think about 
what are the other systems required for scale? You'll need mm -hmm. to have systems around um, recruitment and onboarding of staff and management. You'll need some finance systems. You want some deeper systems around sales, you, you know, some systems for maybe sales managers and how do you set forecasts and targets and things like that. And, and what does your management systems look like? How often are you meeting and what's discussed? And, you know, when, when you do have a sales meeting, what does that agenda look like? So it's, identifying in scale it's about what are the other systems that are required to, to scale your organization and that's really what i focus in on there yeah and then um, and then the last stage is optimizing and i think this is an interesting one right is obviously when you roll out a new system you don't know how it's really going to work until it works right until you put it into play because you know as human beings we're great at doing things that nobody ever expected us to do or yeah. inputting but the other part too is and I think this is sometimes difficult for, for, for people is they think there's always an end point, like this is a project, you've, you've done your system and it's done, but you have to continuously optimize. It's like sales process. A lot of people will put a sales process in place and they think that's it, I've done the sales process now, we can move on to something else and that'll sit there for the next three or four years. Well, guess what? Buying behavior changes, things change, the market, I mean, nowadays, you know, so all of these things have to have a certain level of dyn dynamism. Yes. And you hit on some real key points there. Um, one of the first things I do is by design in the process, we leave optimized to last because mm -hmm. what a lot of people try and do is they do it up front when they're creating the system. But the problem is they, that gets in the way of them getting it done. They look mm -hmm. for perfection and it's very common for people when, you know, when I say, um, a well systemized business. What's the first business that comes to mind when I say, what is a systems business? What business comes to mind? So Amazon. Gonna, yep. Amazon. Um, the other one I see oftentimes people think all the fast food chains, sure. yeah, uh, yeah. franchises and uh, McDonald's oftentimes mm -hmm. comes up. And, and when yeah. people think about uh, McDonald's, oftentimes, if you've known anything about their systems, they have so many systems and everything is detailed, every facet of their business down to the nth degree. So they can hire a 15 year old who can step in and do it. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. If people think that's what a systemized business looks like, and then they think about their own business and they try and make systems like McDonald's or Amazon does, but uh -huh. Amazon Amazon is a behemoth that has been doing this for so many years and they've perfected their systems and their processes. If you try and systemize like Amazon is today, mm -hmm. you'll fail. If you systemize like Amazon did when it first got started 20 years ago or whatever it was, that that's the mindset that you need to be. Amazon mm -hmm. didn't start with these amazing, perfect systems. They started with something clunky and then they evolved. And like you said, it became part of the process and it was mm -hmm. an iterative process. So that's probably the, the big takeaway of leave optimizing to last, make it part of the way that you do things and yeah, systemize like Amazon, which is how Amazon was, not how Amazon mm -hmm. is now. Yeah, exactly. And then make sure you have a culture of continuous improvement and revisiting all the time to make sure that you, um, that you continue to move it forward. Um, so this has been great, David. I mean, I think this is great insights for, for people listening in. Um, all of David's information will be available in his contributor bio below. But before we go, David, do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what your company does. Yes, so uh, the book is probably my biggest contribution to this space. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it outlines the system for systemizing a business. I feel like a lot of the work that's been produced to date, things like the e-myth, traction, scaling up, mm -hmm. uh, all of those books, they build a case for systems, but they don't really say, how do you do it? Where do you get started? What is the first system? And that's what systemology is all about. So mm -hmm. we have obviously the book and I've got some do it yourself type courses. We have programs. And at the moment we're uh, training up our, our gr first group of what we call systemologists. So I'm teaching a group of people who understand how to deploy systemology in businesses. And then they work with business owners to really, uh, extract that knowledge and get it down for their team. So that's a, yeah, what we do over at Systemology. 
Yeah, and that's fantastic. And as we said, I think that if you are not systematizing right now, if you're not looking at your digital process, if you're not looking at your efficiencies, you're going to have a much harder time seeing out the rest of this uh, time during the pandemic. And to be honest, you're going to have a hard time competing when it's all over, because if there's one thing that's happened as a byproduct of where we are today, it's that um, businesses realize that they can't wait any longer to have good efficient systems in place and, and digital processes etc so i would absolutely encourage you to check out uh, david's work and his book uh, because i think this is going to become uh, not a nice thing to do not a nice a nice to have but a must have yeah yeah and i think you're right it almost feels like with this current climate um I've, i remember people saying yeah you only find out when people a swimming naked when the tide goes yeah, out exactly. and it exactly. feels like the tide has just gone out and people's businesses, they're shaky systems makes your business strong. So you've got to go to work on them. All right. Perfect. All right. Listen, uh, thanks David. And thanks everybody for listening in and I'll see you for an expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.